Hello and welcome to the NBA Legacy Podcast. This will be the second episode in our series about the 2011 NBA Finals. The first, if you missed it, is about the Dallas Mavericks road to the series itself. And today we're going to do their opponent's side of the story with the Miami Heat. Yay! So, with the Dallas Mavericks, I had an outline ready to go to start recording the podcast, and I looked at it and was like, oh crap, I didn't say anything about the regular season. Because the story about the 2010-2011 Mavericks is really more about how they get hot during the playoffs, and how well Dirk plays, and how much better he gets through each series. But... For the Miami Heat, it is almost a complete 180 degree flip. I don't even know where you really should start. Do you start with the 2010 series where LeBron and the Cavs had a 61 win season and get upset by the aged Celtics that everybody was counting out? Do you talk about what happened in game five of that series and what that meant? I'm going to go ahead and say no, because I think that's something I want to talk about someday on its own podcast. But do you start with free agency? You can't really tell the story of the 2010-2011 Miami Heat without talking about free agency, right? So, where do you even begin that conversation? Well, I guess you would say that going into the 2010 free agency class, it was hyped like no other. This was really the first great NBA Twitter moment. Everyone checked it every second. I remember refreshing Twitter back on my desktop. I didn't have a smartphone at that point. And I would would go through and I'd look at Woj's timeline, look at Brian Windhorst and Stephen A. and all these different people to try to get a little bit more of an idea of where LeBron was going. Because while there were a lot of other stars in that class... It definitely revolved around LeBron James. Having ended his season in Cleveland on such a bitter note, it felt inevitable that LeBron was going to leave. But where was he going to go? That was the great question, and no one really seemed to have an answer. He would eventually meet with six teams, his hometown team, the Cavs, the Los Angeles Clippers, amazingly enough, even though Donald Sterling at this point was still the owner of the team, and, I th- and at this point, they had just gotten Blake Griffin, I believe, in the draft, but he hadn't proven to be anything. There was no Chris Paul at this point. The New Jersey Nets, who had just been bought by Mikhail Prokhorov, the Russian owner, and were planning to move to Brooklyn, but no one really was sure when. It was a few years off. The team everyone had for years had said he was going to go to in the New York Knicks, but they had no star talent to offer him. My favorite, the team I thought he was actually going to go to at the time, was the Chicago Bulls. The Cavs had actually beaten the Bulls that year in the playoffs in the first round, but I remember thinking that Derrick Rose and Joakim Noah showed so much heart that this was the kind of team LeBron needed to go to. And they had room to actually get another star in addition to LeBron. And then finally, the team that Eh, some people may have thought was a chance, but seemed really unrealistic, was the Miami Heat. Well, as the title of the podcast clearly states, the Miami Heat are the ones that end up getting LeBron, obviously. Neil O'Shea tells a story now. He was currently he was the GM of the Clippers at the time. He is now the GM of the Portland Trailblazers that... LeBron met with two teams per day, and his meeting with the Clippers happened to be on the same day that the Miami Heat were meeting with LeBron. And Miami goes first and takes forever. Neil O'Shea says he's waiting out in the hallway, and he just knows they got him. Pat Riley walks out, apparently has a smile on his face, and he looks at Pat and just goes, it's over, isn't it? And Pat apparently just smiles. The thing is that because it was so hyped and everybody was wanting to know where LeBron was going to go, at some point, and I've never heard whether or not it was LeBron's people or ESPN that decided to do this, 
But somebody has the idea to do a television show where LeBron announces his decision live. Now, LeBron has always been a very charitable person. I think even his most ardent detractors would admit that he is a very giving athlete and rich human being, both with his time and his money. The way the show is structured is they're going to donate any profits to the Boys and Girls Club. Now, there's different reports that supposedly they got about $3 million for the Boys and Girls Club. I don't know. But regardless, at the end of the day, it was worth it. That's 2020 hindsight years later. At the time, this TV show pissed people off. It comes across as a game show when you go back and rewatch it, which I actually did. It's a bit of a weird rewatch. I don't think I don't think anybody that was involved with this had any idea how it was going to come off and that there wasn't a lot of thought put into it beforehand. LeBron sits on a stage with Boys and Girls Club members behind him and he sits on a stage with Jim Gray and Jim Gray asks him every possible question leading up to the actual question everybody wants to know, where are you going? He asks him, when did you decide? Who knows who made the, that he's made this decision? Does the team know? All these different questions just to delay the actual answer to the question everybody wants. And it's ridiculous. When you go back and watch it, it's kind of laughable. And I feel like ESPN actually owes LeBron a little bit of an apology. Because this it's really poorly done, and whoever was the director of the show let not only LeBron down, but also the viewer. It is not even an enjoyable watch. Uh, that said, one of the answers I love that LeBron gives, though, is when Jim Gray asks him when he made his decision, he says, I made it this morning when I woke up and talked to my mom. Now, that's a lie. <laughs> okay. People had the report that LeBron was going to Miami days ahead of time. And I really highly doubt that LeBron didn't tell Dwayne Wade, didn't tell Chris Bosh, hey, yeah, I'm coming. Nope, he made up his mind that very morning that he was doing a television show. It's a nice story, I guess, but it it's not. You, there's no way that's what happened. One thing that's kind of a little bit sad when you watch it is LeBron's 25 years old, mind you. But he is super nervous this entire time. You can see it throughout the entire time. It's like he's on a job interview. A, he's, everything he says is very short. He doesn't elaborate on any of the answers he gives. It's kind of uncomfortable to watch. So finally, when Jim Gray asks him the question of where he's going to go, LeBron utters the famous words, I'm going to take my talents to South Beach and join the Miami Heat. Now, some of you may know this, but at the time, I could tell many, many people were either too young or didn't remember this. Kobe Bryant actually was the one who used that phrase first. When Kobe Bryant decided to go to the NBA and enter the NBA draft as opposed to go to college, he said, I'm going to take my talents and pauses and then says to the NBA. LeBron was ripping off Kobe when he said that. And it's something that almost will be on LeBron's tombstone, which I think is a bit funny. Uh, one thing that is really striking when you watch it, and the reputation you have of this show, is that it's LeBron stomping on the hearts of the Cleveland fans. But LeBron's actually really conciliatory towards Cleveland when you go back and rewatch this. He says a lot of the right things. He talks about how he'll always love those fans in that area and that they had a lot of great memories and that it was just this was the right thing for him to do for his career, he doesn't he doesn't purposely try to hurt the fans. And I think something either he came up with or maybe his team came up with, you can hear him repeat, oh, this is tough. A couple of times, I think that was a planted line to try to make it understood that this was not something that was easy for him, even though I think at the time he was super excited to go down to Miami. So after this, we all see the famous pictures of the Cavs fans burning in LeBron's jersey. I actually don't think there was that many people doing that, but all it took was a couple to get the pictures and they went everywhere. What actually ends up being, to me, the most 
dastardly thing, I guess you'd say, this evening that happens is when the owner of the Cleveland Cavaliers releases a statement. Now, most teams, no matter what their actual opinion is, when a player leaves them, they release the standard press release saying, blah, 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 Can, you know, we wish him the best in his future endeavors type of stuff, right? Well, not Dan Gilbert. And he releases a statement to the fans that is that is famously in the Comic Sans font. So you know we're already starting off well. But as much conversation as this letter has made, I'm not sure everybody has actually ever read it and saw just how ugly it is. And so I think I'm actually going to read it because I think it'll set the stage a little bit for why there's so much vitriol later in the year and why this becomes such a controversial team down the road. So, to start the letter, Dear Cleveland, all of Northeast Ohio and Cleveland Cavalier supporters, wherever you may be tonight, as you now know, our former hero, who grew up in the very region that he deserted this evening, is no longer a Cleveland Cavalier. This was announced with a several-day narcissistic, self-promotional buildup, culminating with a national TV special of his decision. Unlike anything ever witnessed in the history of sports and probably the history of entertainment. Clearly, this is bitterly disappointing to all of us. The good news is that the ownership team and the rest of the hard-working, loyal, and driven staff over here at your hometown Cavaliers have not betrayed you, nor never will betray you. There is so much more to tell you about the events of the recent past and our more than exciting future. Over the next several days and weeks, we will be communicating much of that to you. You simply don't deserve this kind of cowardly betrayal. You have given so much and deserve so much more. In the meantime, I want to make one statement to you tonight. I personally guarantee that the Cleveland Cavaliers will win an NBA championship before the self-titled former King wins one. You can take it to the bank. If you thought we were motivated before tonight to bring the hardware to Cleveland, I can tell you that this shameful display of selfishness and betrayal by one of our very own has shifted our motivation to previously unknown and previously never experienced levels. Some people think they should go to heaven but not have to die to get there. Sorry, but that's simply not how it works. This shocking act of disloyalty from our homegrown chosen one sends the exact opposite lesson of what we want our children to learn and who we want them to grow up to become. But the good news is that the heartless and callous action can only serve as an antidote to the so-called curse in Cleveland, Ohio. The self-declared former king will be taking this curse with him down south. And until he does right by Cleveland and Ohio, James and the town where he plays will unfortunately own this dreaded spell and bad karma. Just watch. Sleep well, Cleveland. Tomorrow is a new and much brighter day. That is insane. I think it's a lot worse than people remember. I think people disremember the chosen one and the stuff that he says about LeBron and the Cavs winning the title first. But to say you're sending a curse to an entire city, that's ludicrous. But it did really resonate with the fans that feel they were just crapped on by LeBron. And it sets the stage for a lot of the reaction to the upcoming welcome party that the Heat throw for LeBron, Wade, and Bosch. This has probably become almost as, maybe even more so, as famous as the decision. This is the biggest free agent coup that anybody's ever had in NBA history. And so they invite a bunch of fans to come down and see them introduce this new big three. Although, early on, I think they were trying to make this the Three Kings deal a marketing deal, a marketing ploy. Because Eric Reed, who is the 
the voice of the Miami Heat and their local broadcasts, he emcees this event, and he keeps pushing this Three Kings language, and that I think it was something that was clearly planted to try to not be the big three, but to be these three kings, because LeBron James is, of course, you know, King James is his nickname. And it's awful, and I'm glad that didn't catch on. Although, later in the show, then they do this welcome party, he also tries out, he, Eric Reed also tries out this Dyna 3. Somebody mentions the idea of a dynasty, and he goes, well, it might not be a dynasty, but it could be a Dyna 3. It is god-awful. This, to me, is actually the worst part of the entire thing. Is it's, this is this People look back on this as this moment of hubris and the idea that these guys are so self-involved and prima donnas, but... To me, that when I go back and I watch the decision, it's this horrible, like, actually poorly produced game show. But this welcome party is completely about selling jerseys and t-shirts and tickets. It's, hey, look at these three guys. This is going to be a lot of fun. Now, would you please give us your money? That's all this, this entire thing is. When you watch it, it's just a promotional event. It feels like it's a car company showing off their new model of car. It is not. It's something when you look back on, I don't, I think we really overreacted to, but that said, it is a big part of the story of the 2010, 2011 heat. Uh, some of the fans there will actually start chanting beat LA, which goes to show you there was an idea that the Lakers had just won the last title. And that meant the heat were going to face them in the finals. Obviously, that they weren't going to have any problems getting through the East. Which, if you're a fan in Boston or Orlando or Chicago, kind of pisses you off a little bit. And this this event's remembered mainly for the infamous LeBron quote, which I'll get to in a second. But Wade has some equally cringeworthy statements. He actually says, quote, Arguably, this is the best trio to play the game of basketball. End quote. <laughs> This, I mean, we're talking about, you know, we look at trios, you have, you know, Elgin Baylor, Jerry West, and Wilt Chamberlain. You have Mikhail Burden Parrish. You have Magic Kareem and Worthy. This team hadn't done anything yet. And this is the kind of talk that's already happening. You can see why this rubs a lot of people the wrong way, especially if you're not a Miami Heat fan or a LeBron James fan, say. One thing that's really funny when you go back and watch this show is Chris, maybe it's, this might be because Wade and LeBron are so attached and they're still friends to this day. And it seems like Bosch is not really that close to those two. But when you watch it, it looks like Wade and LeBron are sitting a little bit closer to each other and Bosch is off to his own. He's definitely the third wheel. It's just something I noticed, and it may just be because I know how the dynamic eventually plays out, but it really does feel like it is Wade and LeBron, and then Bosch is adding on to them, that it's not a true trio. So, the infamous not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, not seven... It is definitely LeBron playing to the crowd. You have to remember the entire time there's cheering fans in this arena while they're talking. It comes off as pretty egotistical considering he hasn't won a championship yet. But I've never understood why this was considered such an unforgivable moment for LeBron. It's Greg Oden when he came in the league. I remember he said he wanted to win 15 championships. It's it's just something players say occasionally. I don't think it's honestly that big of a deal, but this was a moment that will, just like take my talents to South Beach, will be on LeBron's tombstone. This is something that will never be forgotten and is used for fodder by the haters of this team for the rest of the season and up to this day. So basically, I don't think this all of this, the decision and this welcome party that ends up generating that ends up generating all this hate and anger towards the heat really warranted it but it was there 
And it's hard to describe what that was like to somebody nowadays who didn't go through it. The minute LeBron, Wade, and Bosch got together, that was all anyone cared about. Whether it was pro or, or against, this is all we talked about. So that's all well and good for LeBron, Wade, and Bosch and their end of it. But you have to start thinking about what does this mean for Pat Riley and the Heat organization, right? So you add LeBron, Wade, and Bosch, the biggest free agency coup in the history of the league. But that's only three guys. you got to fill out your roster, right? So the only player that was actually under contract with Miami after the 2009-2010 season was Mario Chalmers. Kind of a combo guard who had been a second round pick and who had basically a minuscule contract. Chalmers could shoot a little bit, could defend, couldn't be a ball handler, was more suited to be a backup, but he'd find a place on this team. So Miami would bring back Udonis Haslam. He and Wade would be the only members left for Miami, of the 2006 championship team. Although Haslam would tear a ligament in his foot towards the end of November and would miss most of the regular season. Joel Anthony would be brought back from the previous year's Heat team. Honestly, they needed a center, and Joel Anthony was would actually be pretty important for them. But he was a... Zero on offense. This is a guy that could not remotely score. Danny Luru of the Dunked On podcast, I believe is the one that coined this phrase of record scratch guys. That when they get the ball, everything stops. They have no ability to score and don't even look at the basket. And there is no player I have ever seen that probably crystallizes this term more than Joel Anthony. He'll give Miami a lot of defense and some really good energy off the bench. Ends up probably being the best center they have all season, but definitely a flawed player. With the remaining amount of money they had in free agency, they would eventually sign Mike Miller, who was thought to be a really good spot-up shooter around LeBron and Wade to give them some space. Miller would never really be healthy in his entire run with Miami. This first year, though, is the worst. He he injures his thumb in preseason and misses a large part of the season, but then will also have different injuries to his shoulder and his back. Mike Miller will definitely end up having big moments for the Heat in later seasons, but this year he pretty much is in a suit the whole time. Definitely is absent through most of the regular season, and it really hurts Miami. You'll see how important shooting is for them in some of the additions they'll make after this season. You can't help but feel that if Mike Miller had been healthy for them throughout this year, they would have been a much more successful team and won more games. Originally, they'll sign Carlos Arroyo to be their starting point guard. Arroyo had actually been pretty successful in international play, but had been mainly a backup in the NBA. He could shoot corner jump shots fairly well, but really didn't give you much off the bounce or finishing at the basket. Another center that Miami will try to fit in is actually Zydrunas Elgauskas that follows LeBron from Cleveland to Miami. LeBron has always said he's one of his favorite teammates he's ever had. By all accounts in Cleveland, he's a fantastic guy, but at this point, he is done. Zydrunas had some really good years in Cleveland, He actually was an all-star one year early in his career, but at this point, he's way too slow, and he looks ancient every time you watch the film of him in this this last year. It's a revolving door for center for Miami this season. They'll they'll try Jamal McGlure 
a guy who had been an all-star for Toronto years ago. He doesn't work out, gets limited minutes. Eventually, they'll go with Eric Dampier, who had been a pretty successful center for Dallas a few years earlier, but like Zajrunas and McGlure, his career is heading towards an end. Jawan Howard would actually sign with the Heat in an attempt to ring chase, but never really played much for him. He actually spends more time basically being an assistant coach. He would eventually become an assistant coach for the Miami Heat. Never makes much of a contribution off the bench. Similar is Jerry Stackhouse actually starts the year with the Heat. Doesn't last very long. Gets cut into November. His career is pretty much done after that. Eddie House gives Miami some good shooting. He had played a big role for the Celtics in 2008 off the bench in their championship season. And the idea was he would hopefully help Miami stretch the floor and help against zone defense. He does pretty well for them, but it's only limited minutes. He can't defend at all. Later in the year, Miami would actually cut Carlos Arroyo so that they could actually pick up Mike Bibby in the buyout market. Bibby would actually accept a buyout from the Wizards by giving up an extra year on his contract and forfeiting $6.2 million to go to Miami and chase a ring. With how this season actually turns out for the Heat, it's kind of sad when you know that he doesn't get that ring and gave up $6 million to try for it. But if only he could have told the future, he'd be $6 million richer. Bibby, in theory, is a shooter for the Heat. He'll hit a few buckets here and there, but I think his percentages always are actually pretty rough. Uh, He can't defend, doesn't give you anything off the dribble. So when you look at it, though, this is the roster that the Heat have and Pat Riley have put around LeBron, Wade, and Bosh. And it's one of the more ramshackle, thrown-together rosters you will ever see. It's not necessarily their fault. You, your deal after you spend so much money on these three positions in your roster, the remaining ones are going to be filled with basically minimum guys. But it certainly limits Miami throughout the season, and I think it really plays a part in why they get off to a slow start, which we'll get to talk about now. I can't remember who who actually hosted it, but there was a stream back when they actually had their training camp. You could watch them scrimmage. And people would have takes on, oh, this guy isn't going to be good, or this team's going to be a failure because this this they don't have a center. All these takes off of a simple scrimmage. It was that level. And then when they finally got to preseason, which felt like an eternity, they got together in July, and then you had to wait three months to actually see this team play. It felt like an eternity till you finally got to watch them play. And they have their first preseason game against the Pistons. And I remember Dwayne Wade saying that before that game, he had ran into a fan in Miami that said, good luck tonight against the Pistons. And he said, I had never had anybody wish me good luck in a preseason game before. It was that level of hype. Well, it doesn't super work out because Dwayne Wade gets hurt in the first three minutes against the Pistons, and will miss the entire preseason. So off the bat, things are not great. And so the Heat then opened the season against the Boston Celtics in Boston. This is the matchup that throughout the year Miami is going to be graded against, considering Boston not only beat LeBron and his Cavs in 2010, but also won the East, made the finals, and almost beat the Lakers in a Game 7. Well, the Celtics embarrass the Heat that night. The Heat haven't had their three guys all preseason, and they're brand new together. It was tailor-made for them not to debut well. And it's only a harbinger of things to come because eventually they will go 9-8 and eight in their first 17 games before they end up having a team meeting. And in these losses, they weren't just, you know, losing by five or six or something like that, or, you know, going down the wire and played well, this didn't win. They have a couple really bad losses. There's one in Utah where they eventually, there's one where Utah is actually playing them at home in Miami, and Miami will build a 19-point lead, and it looks like that game's over. I remember watching it, and they'll Utah will climb back in and cut the lead down, 
but Miami will still lead by eight with 30 seconds to go. And they give up multiple threes to Paul Millsap and eventually lose in double overtime. Then a few days later, they'll play Memphis and Rudy Gay, back when he was in Memphis, for those of you that remember that, will hit a jumper over LeBron to break a tie at the buzzer. They were losses that were just kind of gut-wrenching. Then LeBron finally gets to go back to Cleveland. It's December 2nd when LeBron finally goes back, and it is ugly. To this day, I think LeBron is actually a little bit proud that he has it this bad when he goes back, that it's worse that it's worse than any other players ever had when they went back to their team. And it is bad. It, it, the, the booing is horrible. I think it's something that was actually, in retrospective, pretty irresponsible from the Cleveland organization to allow. This is something that easily could have become dangerous. There's talk during the game that they've actually had extra security and the fans are just super nasty. It's understandable to boo, but the level that this goes to is actually kind of inappropriate, looking back at it. That said, though, this Cavs team was not really in position to take advantage of a Heat team that wasn't quite running on all cylinders yet. The Cavs would ultimately have the second-worst record that year, only behind Minnesota when they'd have 19 wins and would go on a 26-game losing streak later in the year. So Miami cruises to the win of 118-90. to uh, The main story, though, is, is how LeBron plays, and he is dominant. He ends up scoring 38 points, makes ridiculous jump shots, and after each one, he goes over and just talks complete trash to the Cavs bench. It's... Rather embarrassing, I would say, all in all, looking back on this, for Cleveland and the Cleveland organization. That's not anything against their fans. And I'm not trying to be mean about it, but this is not a great look, and it's something that you probably, if you could view it over again, you definitely should have done it differently. But this actually gets Miami off to a bit of a winning streak. They'll win 12 games in a row, and they actually end up winning their Christmas Day matchup pretty easily against the Lakers. That was a really hyped game at the time. But the only thing is, they really st still struggle against really good teams. They lose twice to the Dallas Mavericks. Their record against Chicago, a team that actually ends up being the number one seed in the conference that year, is 0-3. And they lose their first three games to Boston. The team that everyone is looking at and saying this is the team they've got to beat. But what really was the worst part of their season, I think most people remember the 9-8 and eight and think of their start as being bad. But at the end of February and the beginning of March, the Heat go on a five-game losing streak that just eats up all the media coverage. It's a dead zone for sports anyway there at the end of February and early March. And so everybody's talking about the fact that the Heat are crumbling again. They, the first loss is to the Knicks. Then they blow a 24-point lead to Orlando and lose by three. San Antonio destroys them by 30, 125-95. And then they lose a one-point game to Chicago for their fourth loss. And after the game, Coach Eric Spolstra, who I apparently haven't mentioned yet, is the coach of the Miami Heat, obviously. He, he goes out in his post-game press conference and says this. Quote, this is painful for every single one of us to go through. There are a couple of guys crying in the locker room right now. End quote. Now, I don't have any problem with that. I really appreciate it when the players and athletes actually care enough that they are brought to tears. But man, this was just the worst thing he could have said at that point. They are endlessly mocked and everyone automatically assumes that it's Chris Bosh who's crying in the locker room. And this is something that will follow him for the rest of his Miami Heat time. He will his manhood is actually questioned nonstop. And it's kind of shameful when you think back on it. But 
the losing isn't over. They eventually lose their fifth game to Portland, 105-96. to And I think this is a rock bottom for them this season, at least in terms of the regular season. This is the worst it gets. Luckily for them, they have a big game against the Lakers scheduled on national TV that they actually end up winning. The Lakers had been on a bit of a win streak and were starting to round into form. As I said in the Dallas podcast, this was still the team everybody was picking to win the title and to get the win over the team that people expected to represent the West in the finals was a big momentum swing for them. They would eventually beat Boston in Miami to get their lone win against Boston during the regular season, blowing them out 100-77. to So while Miami would have some momentum at the end of the season with their win over the Lakers and then over Boston, going into the playoffs, they were still a big question mark. They had definitely played well together on defense. They had great speed with their starting lineup, at least. They would lose a lot of that athleticism when they would go to their bench, considering the age of their bench. But on offense, they were still a major question mark. Throughout the year, there had been various quotes from Eric Spolstra about how they were trying to spread the shots around to the different stars, and that whoever would get the defensive rebound would actually be able to then call the play on the offensive end, which mainly led to LeBron and Dwayne Wade trading ISO possessions instead of running a real offense, and this would often lead to Chris Bosh being marginalized. So they would try to then run where Chris Bosh would be the featured player in the second unit during the start of the second quarter. None of this actually sounds like how a real team is supposed to function. And going into the playoffs, these problems hadn't been solved on the offensive end. But luckily for Miami, in the first round, they would get a matchup with the seventh-seeded Philadelphia 76ers that had gone 41-41 and this season. This would have been post-Allen Iverson, but pre-Sam Hinkie, Andre Iguodala-led 76ers. It's a young team, but not with a lot of superstar talent. You'd have, along with Andre Iguodala, you would have Lou Williams, young Lou Williams, uh, young, super young Drew Holiday, Thaddeus Young, who would actually end up giving Miami some problems and has been a bit underrated throughout his career. And finally, the guy that was supposed to be their star, who would be coming off an Achilles tear and and never really regained his all-star level, was Elton Brand, who's actually now the GM of the Philadelphia 76ers. Pretty much everybody expected Miami to win this series. I remember, I believe, I picked it in a sweep for them to win in four games. It's not a great series. There's not a super great game like there was with Dallas in, De- in their first round series with the Blazers in the game four that Brandon Roy had. Game one actually ends up being a little bit closer than you would expect, though. Philadelphia actually leads 31-19 to after the first quarter. Throughout the LeBron years in Miami, it was always an issue that the Heat would start off flat and would have to fight their way back from falling down after the first quarter. And this series is no different. In the second quarter, they completely flip the script, outscore Philadelphia 35-18, to and would eventually build a 16-point lead in the third quarter. But, as you'll see throughout this postseason, most of Miami's leads are rarely safe. It takes a Dwayne Wade flurry at the end, scoring five points in the last minute to secure the victory. Miami wins Game 1 97-89. Game two ends up being more of what you would have actually expected. The Heat blow out Philadelphia 94-73 to to take a 2-0 series lead. LeBron actually has a big game, has 29 points, 7 rebounds, and 6 assists. And Miami would lead wire to wire and lead the whole game. The series then, of course, shifts to Philadelphia. And with trying not to go down in an 0-3 hole, Philly actually comes out pretty hot. Philadelphia actually will lead after the first quarter in this series, in three out of the five games. Miami has to then 
eventually crawl back and win most of the series. Philadelphia would actually lead most of Game 3, even though as you watch it, you never are in doubt that Miami's going to eventually pull away and win. Dwayne Wade has a big game, 32 points, 10 rebounds. LeBron actually adds 24 points and 15 rebounds. Big rebounding game for LeBron. He's always been a bit, a bit more of an average rebounder for his position. He does a lot of great work this postseason, though, in getting on the boards. Star power is too much. Philadelphia loses 194. Going into Game 4, it really feels like this is going to be a sweep. But once again, Philly will get a big lead early, 28-16 to after the first quarter. But Miami again will come alive in the second quarter and eventually lead at the half, 47-46. to And Miami will control most of the rest of the game and will eventually be up 6 points with 95 seconds left when Drew Holiday and Lou Williams hit big threes and LeBron misses right at the basket with Philadelphia sneaking out and stealing a win 86 to 82 to push the series to five games back to Miami should have been a sweep for sure. I know it sounds like I'm rushing through this series, but there's not a whole lot there. That's memorable. It's a typical first round series for the Eastern conference game. Five is what you kind of expected game four to be Philly again leads in the first quarter, 27 to 23, And then Miami will fight back, and it goes back and forth where Miami holds a slim lead for most of the night. Miami actually has to grind this one out at the end. They're up one with 25 seconds left, and Joel Anthony, of all people, actually gets fouled and has to go make two free throws. Steps up, knocks them both down. Iggy misses a long two at the end, and that's the series. Looking back at this, uh, it's kind of more fun to look at the Philly side of this than it is Miami. I think Miami was a bit lazy in this series and knew all along that Philly was never really going to be a challenge for them to actually beat them four out of seven times. And they kind of used this series more as a warm up, and it should have been a four game sweep. This shouldn't have went five. But you look back on it, Andre Iguodala was supposed to be the superstar for this team. He was never that level of offensive talent, but he's still a great defender, makes LeBron work a lot. One thing uh, that's really funny when you look back and look at this Philadelphia team is, man, if you had to redo different moments from Sam Hinkie's The Process, trading Drew Holiday for what became two first-round picks to New Orleans really is one you probably would like to have back. Drew Holiday was super young, not going to be a superstar point guard, but was definitely was definitely a budding young player and one of probably the 10 best point guards in the league today. He would be fantastic next to Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid today. Other than that, it was pretty ho-hum series. Uh, LeBron would average 24 points a game, 11 rebounds and six assists. Wade, 22 points and eight rebounds. Chris Bosh actually gets 20 and nine. This will not stay this way throughout the playoffs where each one of these guys has such a balanced attack. Waiting for Miami in the second round was going to be the Boston Celtics. The first round ended up being a bit of a formality for Miami, as pretty much everybody expected. But there was a lot of doubt going into this second round against Boston, the team they'd been measured against all year. Now, the deal for Boston, though, going in the series, was they had originally signed Shaquille O'Neal in the offseason to try to bolster their center position after Kendrick Perkins had gotten hurt in the previous year's finals against the Lakers and wouldn't be able to play that game seven. Doc Rivers will still go on ad nauseum that if they had had a healthy Kendrick Perkins in game seven against the Lakers in 2010, the Celtics would have won. So they add Shaq to try to give them more depth at the center position. And halfway through the year towards the trade deadline, they start feeling really good about having Shaq and also Jermaine O'Neal, who they added. So Boston decides to trade Kendrick Perkins to Oklahoma City for Jeff Green to get some more athleticism on the wing that Jeff Green could, in theory, provide. Boston will not be the last team to think this for Jeff Green, but that's not the point right now. So it doesn't sound today like that actually should have been a big trade. That was one of the biggest stories of the 2010-2011 season. Every time after this trade, Boston would not play well or would lose a game or there was even a little bit of drama, everyone 
would mention whether or not this was because they traded Kendrick Perkins. Did they ruin their chemistry by trading their bulky, big, tough center? When you look back on it, it actually ends up being a bit of a wash for both teams. I'm not sure which team you would actually say won this trade, be it Boston or Oklahoma City. But I will say that I think Miami was happy to have the paint a little less crowded when they were getting ready to go into a series against Boston. During the regular season, as I mentioned, uh, Boston won three out of the four matchups. Miami won uh, one of the last game after the Kendrick Perkins trade and towards the end of the season in Miami. So a lot of people were actually picking Boston, but Miami was still pretty much considered the favorite at this point, considering Boston had struggled since that Kendrick Perkins trade. Boston eventually went 56-26 and 26 this season, finishing two wins behind Miami. And so Miami ends up having home court in this series. I think I remember, I picked, I think I can say I picked Miami to win in seven, but I might have picked Boston to win at six. This was a toss-up series for most people. But game one, really, Dwayne Wade is the story coming out the entire game. You can see he knew Miami had to get off to a good start against Boston and hit first and break the facade of this team that was supposed to be the bullies of the Eastern Conference and had stopped both he and LeBron the year before. Going into the series, one of the big questions people had in terms of a matchup was how Miami was going to be able to defend Rajon Rondo. I know that seems a little bit weird now that everybody thinks he's the worst player in the league, but at this point he was a really athletic and smart point guard that gave Cleveland all they could handle the previous year in the second round when they when Boston beat Cleveland in six games. Miami, as I said, had signed Mike Bibby, but that was definitely more of an offensive upgrade. Mike Bibby had a really hard time defending Rondo in the regular season. But in this first quarter of the game one, he actually does a really good job and bothers Rondo on several possessions. But this whole first quarter is about Dwayne Wade. Dwayne Wade will actually score 13 of Miami's 18 points in the first quarter and get some help actually from not LeBron or Chris Bosh, but from James Jones, who will drop 25 points in this game and hit five threes. It's probably the best James Jones game you will ever see, probably the game of his career, and it comes in a really big moment for Miami. And as a usual staple for Miami, once they get a big lead, they'll come out with very little life. It allows Boston to get back into the game, but finally you'll start seeing, other than Wade, LeBron, answers with a couple of nice buckets, puts the heat back up by double digits. The game is never really super in doubt after that uh, in the third quarter. Ray Allen is actually probably the best player of this game for Boston, not Kevin Garnett, Rajon Rondo, or Paul Pierce. uh, He'll have 25 points, uh, 9 of 13 shooting, hits five threes to match James Jones. Although I guess if you're Boston, the idea that James Jones is hitting as many threes as Ray Allen, that's not a great sign for you winning the game. The only really drama in this game was in the fourth quarter when Paul Pierce picks up two technical fouls and gets ejected. First one, he kind of slightly headbutts James Jones after James Jones fouls Paul Pierce on biting on a pump fake. And and then Paul Pierce will run into Dwayne Wade on a baseline screen and they jaw jack, gets ejected. Some Boston fans made a lot of issue with this. You go back and watch it. It's pretty simple. The, The game was already not really in doubt anymore. And it was a pretty easily, but both of these were both technical fouls. Story of the game, Dwayne Wade has 38 points, 14 of 21 shooting. Big game. If you're going to watch a game from this playoff run from Dwayne Wade, it's definitely this one. It completely sets the tone for the rest of the series and gets Miami off on the right foot. Super impressive game. As good as anything you will probably see from LeBron in this playoff run, although he will have his moments, as I will talk about here in a minute. In Game 2, Boston comes out with a lot more energy than they would have had in Game 1, but they have a really hard time in the early going of keeping LeBron from the rim. He gets 8 points in the final 3 minutes of the first quarter right at the basket. When you go back and watch this broadcast, they actually show a graphic on the screen that shows that LeBron and Rondo at this point are tied for number six in playoff triple doubles in 2011. Number one is Magic Johnson with 30. You look at it now, LeBron James has moved up to number two with 23 triple doubles. 
Rondo is now in a four-way tie for number four with Draymond, Bird, Westbrook, and himself, each of them having 10 triple doubles apiece. It's pretty crazy to think how far back ago this was that LeBron has added 17 triple doubles to his total since this playoff series. Little bit of trivia, I just thought I wanted to add that. Second quarter keeps going, it's a grind, not a whole lot of separation. Same thing in the third quarter, both teams trading buckets. It's a real defensive grind, this is not a high scoring series by any means. Although it'll look like an offensive paradise compared to what eventually Miami will have against Chicago in the next series. LeBron will start to heat up towards the end of the third, having 12 points on 5 of 6 shooting, giving Miami a bit of a bump heading into the fourth quarter. Pierce, though, will come out and tie the game 80 apiece with two free throws, a 7-10 left in the fourth quarter. Quick three from Chalmers and two at the line from Wade puts Miami back up five with six minutes to go. LeBron will then score seven unanswered points and pushes Miami up 12. Boston will never really threaten Miami again, and eventually Miami will win 102-91. to Wade's game one was much more impactful and impressive than this, but LeBron gives a great performance here. 35 points, 14 of 25 shooting, best player in this game, and will add 24 points in the second half, securing the victory for Miami, coming up big when it mattered. Wade, though, has another good game, has 28 points himself. Even though this will end up being a five-game series, spoiler alert, this is a pretty tight series in all these games, except for game three, where Boston where Boston wins pretty comfortably, outscoring Miami 97-81 to 81 in the final. Not a super exciting game to go back and rewatch, but there's a few little nuggets here that are worth talking about. Shaq will actually play eight and a half minutes and scores one basket. Now, Shaq looked pretty good for Boston in the beginning of the season, but had struggled with calf injuries throughout the year and was never able to get back on track. These two points in this game are the last two points to Shaquille O'Neal scores of his career. It comes with one minute left in the first quarter, and that's it. He will You will see an appearance for Shaq in game four. He'll play a couple minutes. He'll play, I think it's three, three and a half minutes, but he doesn't score. This is basically it for Shaquille O'Neal's career. And it's kind of sad to see. It's, it's definitely one of the less glamorous exits you'll see for a player of that level. I consider Shaq to be one of the 10 greatest players of all time. That said, in this game, it's mainly about Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce. Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett combined for 24 points in the first half. Eventually, Kevin Garnett's final line will be 28 points and 18 rebounds, making 13 of 20 shots. Just a beast of a performance. It will not, though, be the last time Miami has a problem stopping a scoring power forward, but we will get to that later. So, there's only really one more thing to talk about with Game 3, though. And it's the Dwayne Wade, Rajon Rondo incident. With seven minutes to go in the third quarter, Wade and Rondo get tangled up, and Wade falls down, grabbing Rajon Rondo in the process. Rondo tries to brace his fall with his arm, with his off arm that Wade hasn't grabbed. But on his landing, his Rondo's elbow bends in the wrong direction. It's pretty gnarly to watch. It's amazing that he ends up only dislocating his elbow. When you watch it, you feel almost certain he breaks it. It's pretty gross. Doc Rivers will eventually say that if he had actually seen the play happen, he wouldn't have left Rondo in the game which he does, and Rondo plays pretty well down the stretch, giving Boston a bit of a spark to keep the lead and go on to win Game 3. Later, towards the next season, Rajon Rondo will be giving an interview and will, in a roundabout way, accuse Dwayne Wade of being a dirty player. And a large part of that comes from this play here. Many people do consider Dwayne Wade to be dirty. Now, do I consider this dirty? Yeah, I kind of do. I do not believe that Dwayne Wade intentionally meant to hurt Rajon Rondo or injure him. But I think Wade knew he was falling down and he was going to wrap his arm around Rondo and bring him down with him. This whole series, Wade is trying to bring the physicality to Boston, and I think it was a bit of a reckless play. If you're a Heat fan, you think that's probably fine. 
if you're a Celtics fan, I'm sure you're pretty pissed off that he almost broke Rondo's arm. But that was the big story coming out of this game. Rondo would play the next two games with a padded sleeve over his elbow, and his effectiveness is a bit limited, which we will get to. So going into game four, though, Miami still leads 2-1 in the series, but it's heading into Boston, and there's a sense that the situation is ripe for Miami to choke and for Boston to come back and win this series. This is kind of what happened the year before, although the series was 2-1 heading into Game 4 in the Boston-Cleveland series with LeBron the year before. The teams had split both home and away. It wasn't a 2-0 lead at home going to Boston. But there still was this idea that not so much Wade, but LeBron was going to crack under the pressure. That we'd seen it last year, that he came up in Game 5 and had a horrible performance against Boston and lost a series that the Cavs were favored to win. And it doesn't help that in Game 3, LeBron had probably his worst game of these playoffs up until this point, when he only has 15 points and shoots 6 of 16 from the field and is a minus 21 for the game. Game 4, Boston, sensing they have a huge opportunity, comes out with all the energy. Miami's very sloppy early on, bad shots, turnovers. After Game 3, Chris Bosh actually admitted, and I'm surprised he said this to the media, he only scored 6 points in Game 3 and admitted that the crowd in Boston and the atmosphere got to him and made him nervous. I commend any player for being honest. I want players to be honest when they're asked questions. I don't want the stock canned answers they always give, but it's a hell of a thing to admit in the playoff series that you were shook by a road crowd. Rondo actually plays a little bit more aggressive being hurt than he'll often will when he's healthy. That's always been one of the criticisms of Rondo, that he would be super aggressive in in big moments and in big games, but then there'd be other times when he would need to be that aggressive and would be a passive player and look to get his assists total up. This game, he comes out strong, has six points in the first quarter. According to the broadcast, he hasn't taken any pain medicine at all for this injury. Tougher than I am, for sure. I could never... I stubbed my toe and I couldn't play basketball, let alone play with a dislocated elbow and torn ligaments. Pierce comes out big in this game for Boston, has 14 points in the first quarter, 4 of 6 from the field, although LeBron will match him with 13 points of his own, but Boston will lead 31-28 to after the first quarter, and Boston will actually build an 11-point lead early in the second quarter. Looks like this is going to head back to a 2-2 series. Miami is a little bit in the danger zone here, and it feels like Boston is really pressing and getting the momentum on their side. But luckily for Miami, Boston will go cold towards the end of the second quarter and allow Miami to get back in the game a bit. They full, they don't take a full advantage, but the Boston's lead is cut to 53 points to 50 going into the second half. And this is probably as good a point as any to talk about the game Kevin Garnett has. As great as he was in Game 3, this is a really miserable performance for Kevin Garnett. I think it's a combination of a couple things. Kevin Garnett at this point is older in his career. His prime days are definitely behind him. But we all look back on the reputation Kevin Garnett has as this super aggressive, alpha, angry, intimidating presence. And while that was true, there was a reason when he was in Minnesota he got the nickname Kevin Garnett. Now, I hate these kind of like playful nicknames and using them to trash players, but... Kevin Garnett needed to play with aggressive scorers. Garnett's best skills were primarily playing defense and giving leadership to his team and never letting up. Kevin Garnett could be a really good offensive player and made today would probably even be better with his ability to stretch the floor. He would shoot threes today, but Kevin Garnett throughout his career would float in games and not always be the most aggressive of players. He eventually only ends up scoring 7 points and shoots 1 of 10 from the field. It's a very rough game, and you feel that if Kevin Grant had been a little bit better, Boston ties this series 2-2, going back to Miami for Game 5. Third quarter ends up being a bit of a grind. Boston will win it 20 points to 19 and have a 4-point lead heading into the fourth quarter. 
Miami will eventually actually take the lead, though, from Boston with six minutes remaining after LeBron makes a free throw and a layup on back-to-back possessions. Although, right after this, they'll trade possessions for a few minutes, and then Ray Allen hits what looks to be a bitter dagger for Miami with 225 remaining. But the next possession down the floor, LeBron gets the ball in the corner right in front of the Boston bench. It's actually amazing to to see how many players were jeering at LeBron when he catches this ball. You see Doc Rivers standing next to him and the entire Celtics bench, including Glenn Davis, yelling at LeBron to miss this shot. LeBron drains his own three right over Paul Pierce. It is as cold-blooded of a shot as it gets. Tie game, 84-84 with two minutes left. And then Rondo will actually miss a point-blank layup with one minute left, and the score is still tied. LeBron gets to the front of the rim, gives Miami an 86-84 to lead with 48 seconds left, but then Paul Pierce answers with a layup of his own, makes it 86-86, to 41 seconds remaining. LeBron, for all his brilliance in making that three, will then turn the ball over, loses the handle on his dribble. Ray Allen gets the steal, 19.5 seconds remaining. So, this is a tie game. It looks like Boston should probably get a really good look here. You can see Wade on camera admonishing LeBron, saying, get a stop. I love when we're able to get those little moments, because it tells you so much about the inner workings of the team. Going into the play, though, it ends up being one of the stranger possessions I've ever seen from a veteran team in such a big moment. I think what the plan was, Paul Pierce will get the ball at the top of the key, and I think the plan was for Kevin Garnett to come up and set a screen and play pick and roll with Garnett and Pierce to get the last shot to try to pick LeBron off Pierce. But Ray Allen seems to be confused, and it looks like his idea is that they're running a pick for Allen to get an open three off Garnett. Garnett and Ray Allen miscommunicate. The time starts to run down, and Paul Pierce has to ISO and just take a long two over LeBron. LeBron does contest very well, and it misses. We're going to overtime. So he gets the stop, I guess, that Dwayne Wade told him he had to get, even though the road to getting there is definitely filled with a lot of Boston mistakes. It's a really weird possession to watch from a team like this. Overtime, though, ends up not being much of a story. Boston falls apart. Miami outscores them 12-4, to and that's really it. It feels like this game should have been Boston's and that Miami squeaks it by a little bit, but LeBron makes the big shot and a stop to save the game. We go back to Miami with Miami up 3-1 in the series. The final score of Game 4 ended up being 98-90. to Rondo played pretty admirably, has 10 points, 5 assists, 4 of 7 shooting. Paul Pierce, even though they had the mistakes down the stretch, had a really nice game, 27 points and 8 rebounds, 10 of 20 shooting. Bosch actually gets the better of Kevin Garnett in this game. As I said, Kevin Garnett has a bad game. Bosch will get 20 points and 12 rebounds himself. Wade, very good, 28 points and 9 rebounds. LeBron, though, has 35 points and 14 rebounds. Really does great board work in this playoff run for Miami. Doesn't shoot the ball super well, 12 of 28, but made big plays when it mattered. And going back to Miami now with a 3-1 lead, looking to close out Boston. A year after, he was embarrassed by them and kind of forced out of Cleveland. One thing that is really hilarious, you hear in the Game 5 commentary that Spolster tells a story. LeBron tells Spo that Game 4 was the hardest game he had ever played. Kind of hilarious when you know the future for LeBron, that not even just this rest of this playoff run in 2011, but the wars he will have later on with Indiana and Golden State and San Antonio, that this Game 4 was the hardest game he has ever played. It gets much worse for LeBron from here on out. This will be this will seem like a cakewalk, I'm sure, to some of the wars he has later later on. In the in the last few years, with a lot of the team guys from Boston becoming media members, they've become a bit of well, they become kind of annoying, to be honest. You have Kevin Garnett going on Bill Simmons' podcast and bigging up 
what they did and how well they played together in their championship run and how they broke LeBron. You have Paul Pierce, it's seemingly on a weekly basis, making some weird outlandish claim about who was better than who and who's a top five player. But this Boston team, it's easy to forget, they weren't the greatest team that ever played together, but they did play with heart. And coming into this game five, you knew they weren't going to lay down and just go home. They come out with a lot of fight. Kevin Garnett plays a lot better, gets 12 points, and uh, hits five of seven in the first quarter. Boston lead 24 to 16 after one. And then Boston will actually push their lead up to 10 early in the second quarter. But Dwayne Wade really comes through, plays big in the first half for Miami. He has 23 of Miami's 47 first half points. Boston, though, will lead 49 to 47 at the half. You start really seeing in this game how devastating LeBron and Wade are as a duo and how hard it is for any team to stop those two guys four times out of seven. They may have an off night, but it's really unlikely that both of them are going to have enough off nights for you to win four times out of seven against that kind of talent. It's actually a tale of two halves for both. Wade will have 23 points in the first half and 11 points in the second half. LeBron has 10 points in the first half and 23 points in the second half. Basically a tag team effort. Before I finish talking about this game, I do want to say I think Doc Rivers is a fantastic coach. If I had a team with a lot of talent and stars, I'm not sure there's another coach in the league right now that I would want to coach them more than Doc Rivers. But man, does he complain constantly. Literally every call, regardless of the quality of the call, it can be a bad call. It can be perfectly fine where you watch the replay and you're like, yep, got fouled. Or the ball was out on this guy or it was a travel, whatever. Doc Rivers complains every single time. It, it's really obnoxious. I, I actually think if you're a basketball nerd out there, a, a great drinking game would be to watch a playoff game that Doc Rivers coached in and take a drink every time the camera cuts to him complaining to a referee. You'd be drunk by the end of the first half. No question. Finishing out this game, Boston will hold the lead going into the fourth quarter. Miami just trades some baskets with them. They get a little bit of a momentum going, but they're not able to break Boston's lead until the fourth quarter. Boston only leads by two heading into the fourth quarter, 73-71. to 71. Although they do push the lead up to six with 4.15 remaining in the fourth quarter. You feel like Boston lets Miami hang around a little bit, even though they were building some momentum in the, the third quarter going into the fourth. Miami actually misses four free throws in this quarter. Wade goes two of four at the line, and LeBron only goes one of three. So there's opportunities there that Boston could have easily capitalized on and pushed the lead further to get this to a sixth game and back to Boston. But Bosch will actually tie the game with a dunk on the baseline, three minutes left to play. 87-87 to 87 is the score. LeBron comes down and drills a three from the corner. 90-87, to 87, there's two minutes and 11 seconds left. Wade will then miss a layup on the next possession. After an offensive rebound by Bosch, Wade gets another shot, misses a jumper. Paul Pierce goes down the floor and just hits a bad pass to Jeff Green in the corner. Goes off Jeff Green's hand. Back to Miami, one minute left. It's The score is still 90-87. to 87. And LeBron hits a step back three over Paul Pierce. 40 seconds left, pushing the score 93 to 87. Next possession down, LeBron will pick off a pass to Paul Pierce. Gets a breakaway dunk with 34.5 seconds left, pushing the score even further 95 87 for Miami. And then finally on the last possession, LeBron gets a layup off the glass. 6.5 seconds left. Score is 97 to 87. That'll be your game. Miami wins the series four games to one. Now, this series often gets overlooked because next season in 2012, LeBron and the Heat go to seven games with Boston, and LeBron has his infamous game six that will be remembered forever. But this series and this last couple minutes for LeBron is about as clutch as it gets. I gave Dirk Nowitzki a lot of praise in the previous podcast for a lot of his closing moments, especially against Oklahoma City in the Western Conference Finals of that series. 
But LeBron James, in these last two minutes, closes the door on a team, and a good team at that, in a way that I don't think I've seen many other players do. It'll be forgotten because of how he'll play in the finals, which we'll get to in the next episode, I promise. But this is a great moment, regardless of what happens later in the playoffs for LeBron and his super clutch. LeBron, though, will not actually be the leading scorer for the game. Dwayne Wade has 34 points and 10 rebounds. LeBron has 33 points himself. Chris Bosh has a decent game, 14 points and 11 rebounds. One thing that was actually interesting to watch the last couple games, with Rajon Rondo being hurt, you would think it really would have worsened Boston's chances in the series, but Delonte West comes in, and I'm not making any Delonte West jokes. That's not this podcast. But Delonte West comes in and gives Boston a great lift with Rondo being hurt. He actually scores 10 points in this game, matching what Rondo did in the previous game, and actually has really great shooting percentages. It's not just the 10 points. He actually ended up shooting 53% from the field and 47% from three. Great numbers, and actually gives them Boston some really nice plays in the fourth quarter when it looks like they might actually push Miami to game six. This probably should have been a seven-game series. I think a lot of people will remember the next series I'll get to in a second with Chicago as being the more competitive series, but this series with Boston is actually a lot tighter and a lot more nip and tuck for Miami to win than I think people will remember. Dwayne Wade will actually be the best player in the series and I think was the big difference for Miami. He'll average 30 points and seven rebounds with 52% shooting in this series, 61% true shooting. Probably the last really great Dwayne Wade series. After this 2011 playoff run, Wade will never really have his knees right again. And it's great to go back and watch and see just how good Dwayne Wade was. I think we've forgotten that a little bit in the last few years, that, that Dwayne Wade's best game was about as good as anybody's best game. Another thing that's really cool to go back and see is Chris Bosh doesn't shoot any threes at all for this series. He'll eventually morph into being a stretch five, and he'll shoot a lot of threes by the time his career ends in Miami. But back then, he is a long two and sometimes post-up player. It is cra- it's crazy to think how much the game has changed and what a different team this probably could have been if they had parked Bosh out of the three-point line and had him as a stretch five to give that space around Wade and LeBron. One other, I guess, controversial moment from the series is after the game is over and the Heat are celebrating going to the conference finals, LeBron kneels like that he's overcome with emotion. And if you see the famous picture, when you pull back, all you see is LeBron kneeling in a circle around a bunch of cameras. It looks like he is posed to get this moment. And he probably is. I think one thing that a lot of people have had a problem with LeBron for over the years has been the idea that he is manufactured and that he always is kind of fake. I can see both sides of this, though. I do really believe that beating Boston was a major motivating factor for why he went to Miami in the first place. And that actually, at the end of this game, LeBron seems super hyped up and takes over this game personally and secures the victory by scoring those 10 points in the last two minutes. And so I'm not entirely sure he wasn't emotional with this victory. Doesn't mean he doesn't know where the cameras are and where to put himself to get that image. I can see it going both ways. I'm not going to give the guy too much criticism on that, though. I think it's actually kind of funny. Now, waiting for Miami in the conference finals is going to be the Chicago Bulls. The Bulls ended up having a really great season this year. Tom Thibodeau, their coach, would win Coach of the Year. Derrick Rose would be the youngest MVP to ever win the award, still is the youngest MVP to ever win, and would have a 62-20 and record, best in the NBA, having home court, throughout the playoffs, including obviously the series. Derrick Rose winning the MVP has long been one of the great debates we've had about the award in the last few years. Looking back on the voting, I had said in the previous podcast that Dirk was sixth. Dwight Howard ends up being second. He's a popular pick now for a lot of people. 
that should that believe he should have won this award. LeBron will end up finishing third in voting, and Dwayne Wade finishes seventh. Eventually, someday, I'm sure I'll do a podcast on Derrick Rose's MVP year. Short to say, I think at the end of the regular season, he's a fine choice for MVP considering the year Chicago had. But this series is going to be a bit rough for his case for him having been the most valuable player of the 2011 season. Miami had actually lost all three games against Chicago in the regular season this year, and all of them had been really close contests where Miami had actually just kind of fallen down the stretch. Each game was decided by four points or less, and Miami would end up being the favorite, even though Chicago had the better record in home court in this series. After beating Boston, most people were picking Miami to win this series. It also didn't help that in the previous two rounds for Chicago, they had struggled in the 1-8 matchup with Indiana and in the second round against Atlanta. To get by both teams, it seemed a lot harder for them than most people were expecting. Game 1, though, ends up being a lot different than people were expecting. Miami will lead early in this game, and and are up 23-20 after 1. The Bulls will fight back, and it'll be a tie game, 48-48 at the half. Chris Bosh ends up having a hell of a game here. Has a 17 points on 8 of 13 shooting at the half. LeBron and Wade will really struggle in this game. Midway through the third, though, it's still close. Miami will have a lead of 58 to 57, and then Chicago will trigger a 10-0 run. Miami has no answer at this point. They don't seem to have a lot of fight. It seems to be kind of a little bit of a resigned feeling to the wave that Chicago is hitting them with. Chicago eventually pulls away. Chicago will pull away, and then it's not much of a game in the fourth quarter. Final score is 103-82, to Chicago up 1-0 in the series. Bosch eventually finishes with 30 points, uh, 12 of 17 shooting. His best game of the playoffs by far to this point. Wade and LeBron will actually combine for just 33 points on 12 for 32 shooting. Really hard to believe that Miami could ever win a game with this team and the roster they have with LeBron and Wade playing that poorly. One guy from Chicago, though, we talk a lot about Derrick Rose. One guy from Chicago, I think, that really has been undersold recently has been Joakim Noah. I think that people remember him now from the last few years of his career and think he was a bit of an overrated kind of scrub. Joakim Noah was really good. He gives Miami a lot of problems in this game. He gets his hands on almost all the loose balls and the 50-50 balls. And considering Miami has such a lack of talent at the five position, he is a matchup nightmare through this entire series. And when you watch Noah play now, it's really easy to see him actually playing in today's game and being a bit of a hub of an offense in the way that Mark Gasol was for Memphis a few years back. And because Noah is a really good passer, one of the, you, you'll see him actually get a rebound take it on the break and pass to an open shooter in transition. That's not something you see from a lot of centers ever, let alone back in 2011. Now, usually when you're down 0-1 in a series, it's not a huge deal. But at the time, it really felt like Game 2 against Chicago in Chicago was a must-win game for Miami. That if they went down 0-2, even though they would then be going back to Miami for their part of the series that that they didn't have the togetherness and the continuity to be able to fight back and play as a team that they had to play from either a tie or from ahead. And going into this game, it was obvious that Miami had to do something to combat Chicago on the boards. So they try early on to bring in Jamal McGlore as an answer. Spoiler alert, he is not the answer. He doesn't play well. Jamal McGlure will be out of the league, I believe, after this season. It's you can see that it feels like Spolstra is reaching very early on in this game. Miami comes out with more energy than they had in game one, but Chicago really still is able to punish them. And you can hear the commentators, especially Steve Kerr, talking about this feels like it's not an effort or talent issue but a personnel issue, that they just don't have the size and the skill up front to be able to deal with Chicago. 
especially in the second quarter. The score is close, but it does kind of feel like Miami's searching and they might be on the edge of disaster. That they might not be able to figure this out and you might see Chicago eventually start pulling away. But what will happen is in the fourth, thir- with four minutes and 30 seconds left in the first quarter, Miami checked, let's actually bring back Udonis Haslam. He had been reactivated in the Boston series, but hadn't seen a lot of minutes. And he'll completely flip this game. He actually won't be that impressive if you're looking at the box score. He ends up with 13 points and five rebounds. But what he'll actually do for Miami, especially in the third quarter, where he'll have nine points on four or four shooting, is really give Miami some fight on the glass. And Haslam will have big moments for Miami in the following years, especially in, these, in a couple of games against Indiana. But I will always remember this as the Haslam game because I think Miami was teetering a bit. And Haslam emerging and playing well changes this entire game and the series for Miami going forward. Heading into the fourth corner, Miami actually leads 71-65. to 65. Although early in the fourth quarter, it is a huge grind. The combined score of this entire quarter, though, for both teams actually ends up being 24 points. Not super beautiful offense. The only player that seems to be able to get going in this quarter is pretty much LeBron. He'll have nine of Miami's 14 points. Chicago, though, will fight back and tie the game at 73 with seven minutes and 13 seconds left. Taj Gibson will almost match LeBron in this quarter for Chicago. Has eight points in four of five shooting. Taj Gibson's always a guy I've liked. I wish he could have caught on with a team like this Miami team or the Golden State Warriors a few years later. One of these guys that's never flashy, but a great role player, and gives Miami some problems in this series. Uh, Another thing that is really awesome when you watch this old series is the Chicago crowd is fantastic. I really hope that Chicago soon gets a good team, because their fans really show up and are loud. But their hearts are going to get a little broken here in a couple minutes. LeBron will break the tie with a three with four minutes and 28 seconds left. And then will hit a fadeaway jumper with three minutes and 15 seconds left to push Miami's lead to 78 to 73. Taj Gibson will get a dunk with two minutes and 29 seconds left to give Chicago 75 points. That is the last points they will score of the game. You will see LeBron score a bunch of baskets towards the end. He'll gather his own miss to lay it back in, pushing the score 82-75, to 75, and then seals the win with a long two over Luol Deng with 47 seconds left. LeBron finishes the game with 29 points, 10 rebounds, and 5 assists, 12 of 21 shooting. Wade will have 24 points and 9 rebounds of his own. Bosch will come back down to earth, 10 points and 8 rebounds for him. Now this is probably a good a time as any to have the Derrick Rose conversation for this series. Derrick Rose will have 21 points and 8 assists in this game, but he'll shoot 7 of 23. It'll get worse from here. Miami ties the series. It's 1-1 heading now to Miami for games 3 and 4. Game 3, we go there for all the drama. Miami is in pretty solid control of the series from here on out. The defensive nature, though, continues. Score is only 18-15 to after the first quarter, with Miami leading. In this game, Chris Bosh and Carlos Boozer actually have a bit of a weird third-wheel duel where Boozer will have 26 points on 8 of 19 shooting, and Bosh will have 34 points on 13 of 18 shooting. Especially in the second quarter, these two guys get going. It's a bit odd considering neither guy is really the offensive hub for their team, and it just seems to be that both guys get hot and they let them go at each other for a decent portion of the game. Miami will lead 43-40 to at the half, even though it's only a three-point lead. It feels like Chicago's never quite able to knock on the door. Uh, stalemate through the third quarter continues. Scoring jumps up a little bit, 25-25. to Boozer scores 12 points in the quarter, but no edge is gained. Miami actually will build a 7-point lead. It feels like they're up 20, considering how low the scoring is in this series. Uh, But Chicago will fight back, and heading into the fourth quarter, uh, you've got a 68-65 to lead for Miami. But down the stretch, LeBron and Bosh come up big, score 20 points for Miami, 7 of 9 in the fourth quarter. 
for both guys. You will never really see Chris Bosh play this aggressively again. I think at this point, he not only has more of a green light, but he also has confidence that he will definitely lose going forward with Miami. A lot of people will criticize LeBron now for how Chris Bosh played, but you can see there were moments where Chris Bosh played well next to LeBron, especially in this early run and in the series against Chicago. If you want to make a Hall of Fame case for Chris Bosh, this is a great game to show people. He is fantastic. He is utterly unstoppable against Chicago in this game. Miami will eventually hold on to win 96 to 85. The score will always look closer in this game than it actually was, but there was never much doubt Chicago was really threatening to win this game. LeBron has 22 points and 10 assists. Wade ends up having a bit of a struggle the next few games. 17 points and 9 rebounds for Wade. Derrick Rose has probably his most efficient game of the series. 20 points, 8 of 19 shooting. Not great, but an improvement from game 2. Miami will lead the series now two games to one. Game four starts off a bit rough for Miami. LeBron is the only guy that has anything going. He'll score 12 of Miami's 16 first quarter points. But Chicago has a much more balanced scoring attack and will lead 19 to 16 after that first quarter. But it really feels like with how big of a mess Miami is outside of LeBron in this first quarter, Chicago misses a big opportunity to build a bigger lead than just three points. The Bulls will actually lead 19-8 to with four minutes and 22 seconds left in the first quarter, and LeBron goes on an 8-0 run himself to cut the deficit to that three points. Miami then quickly takes the lead in the second half. The lead gets traded back and forth in the second. Chicago, though, still holds the lead at the half, 46-44. to and will actually have probably their best chance to tie this series going into the third quarter. They hold strong and eventually go up by nine points with the lead holding at five heading into the fourth quarter, 68 to 63. And finally, as Udonis Haslam did for Miami in game two, Mike Miller gets going for Miami and will have nine points on four or four shooting in this fourth quarter. Now, one of the big issues when you go back and look at this first year for the Heat team with LeBron, Wade, and Bosh is how bad the players around them are and how limited and how little they can actually contribute. Mike Miller getting hurt along with Haslam is a major reason why they struggled. You can see in this game that Mike Miller, while he doesn't shoot well in this run, he will have big moments for Miami in their series later on that actually helped them win championships in 2012 and 2013. And if they had had a healthy Mike Miller or a shooter of that caliber throughout this season, it would have provided much more space for LeBron and Wade. And losing Mike Miller probably could, you could argue, might have been more impactful than losing Udonis Haslam for the majority of that season. They are a completely different team when they have someone at the three-point line that you have to guard. Eventually, Miami is able to get the game back tied at 80 apiece with three minutes to go. And this is the point in the series where LeBron starts to defend Derrick Rose at the end of games. They didn't really have anyone that was able to stay in front of Rose and his speed at the guard position. Wade was even seeming to have some problems. And so Spolster then makes the decision to put LeBron on Derrick Rose at the ends of these games to really see if LeBron's length can give Derrick Rose some problems. And LeBron will end up giving Derrick Rose a lot of problems at the end of these games where he's not able to remotely get to the basket and get around LeBron. Though the score is still tied 85-85 to with 24 seconds left, LeBron will catch the ball, wind the clock down, but picks up an offensive foul when he knocks over Ronnie Brewer on a back down. Not sure it was really a foul when you watch the replay, It's a bit of a rough call, but Chicago ends up not being able to take advantage with 8.5 seconds left. LeBron is able to contest Rose on a long two, and Derrick Rose airballs the shot. We go to overtime. As it was in Game 4 against Boston, not a great overtime. Nothing exciting happens. The score will ultimately be 101-93. to Miami outscores Chicago 16-8 in overtime. 
Only Wade, LeBron, and Bosh score for Miami. Everyone else goes scoreless. Rose only shoots one of five in the entire overtime. And now Miami has a 3-1 lead in this series. LeBron has a big game, 35 points. He shoots it a little bit rough, 11 of 26 from the field. Bosh will add 22 points, 6 of 12 from the field. Wade has a rough game, 14 points, 5 of 16 shooting. Although in comparison, Derrick Rose has 23 points, 8 of 27 from the field. He's not getting to the basket at all. Miami's able to completely cut off his drives and play for his jump shot, and he's not knocking shots down. Going into Game 5, though, I remember at this point feeling that Miami was obviously going to win the series, but they were going to win it in six games. That Chicago would go home in Game 5, win Game 5, and Miami would close them out and at home in, in Miami for Game 6. So Chicago comes out in the first quarter of Game 5 and has the lead 25-21 to 21 and continues to the half. Chicago actually goes up by 7, 45 to 38 at the half. Looks like the, what you expect. The Chicago is going to not lose at home. Miami's only able to, throughout the entire third quarter to cut two points off that lead. Score is 62 to 57 going into the fourth quarter. With three minutes and eight seconds remaining, Chicago has a 12 point lead. And I remember at this point almost turning off the game. I thought, this is over, Chicago's going to hold on, we're going to get a game six. But for some reason, I didn't turn the game off and decided to go ahead and finish it, which turns out to be a bit of a good thing because this is a hell of a comeback for Miami. What eventually triggers this run is Dwayne Wade will get an and one that cuts the score down to 77 to 69 for Chicago, with Chicago holding the lead. Chicago will have an empty possession, Miami gets the ball back. LeBron hits a three with 207 remaining. The score is now 77 to 72. Derrick Rose, though, will then make a shot to push the lead back up to seven points. 79, 72 is your score. Okay, it looks like Chicago is steadying things, but the next possession down, Derrick Rose fouls Dwayne Wade on a three point shot. Wade makes the shot and goes to the free throw line to have a four point play. Score is now 79 to 76. Another Rose miss. LeBron gets the ball next time down. Hits a three with one minute remaining. Tie game, 79-79. LeBron will then steal the ball from Derrick Rose and gives Miami the lead with 29.5 seconds left. Looks like Rose is actually going to get a chance to redeem himself when LeBron fouls him on the next possession, but Rose splits the free throws, making one of two. Score is now 81-80. to 80. They'll intentionally foul Chris Bosh on the next possession. Bosh will make both free throws, pushing the score to 83-80, to 80, Miami's lead. And after that, Derrick Rose gets a look at the three, but LeBron James blocks it at the buzzer, and that's your series. Chicago blows a 12-point lead late, And Miami wins the series four games to one. Final score being 83 to 80. This is the game where afterwards in the locker room when they're interviewing the players, Joakim Noah has the famous quote that Miami, LeBron, and Wade are very good, but they're Hollywood as hell. Which actually became a t-shirt, I believe, for Miami later on. In this series... I said before I went through the recap of these games that I believe that Derrick Rose was a worthy MVP. He has a very rough series, though. Ultimately, he will average 23.4 points per game. Not bad, but he only shoots 35% from the field. In this entire series, Derrick Rose will make 42 shots and attempt 120. It's rough. There's a couple different series people like to talk about when it comes to this kind of duel between the guy who won the MVP the year previously and the guy who took the award from him this season. You have when Hakeem Olajuwon and David Robinson met in the 95 conference finals with the Rockets and the Spurs, a series that almost defines David Robinson's career to most people, 
when he gets completely outplayed by Hakeem Olajuwon. And then you have the 1997 NBA Finals with Karl Malone and Michael Jordan. Another series where no one after watching that series would tell you that Karl Malone is more valuable than Michael Jordan. This series gets forgotten a little bit, but it's definitely in that vein. LeBron James ends up playing 45 minutes per game, averages 26 points per game, 8 rebounds, 6.6 assists, and shoots 39% from 3 and 45% from the field. He is absolutely a better basketball player than Derrick Rose. It's not an argument after this series. Maybe it's because what will eventually happen in the finals with LeBron, but this is every bit in the class of those two other series where you see the previous MVP show up and let the young new guy know who the real MVP is. The next year in 2012, Derrick Rose blows his knee out, and that's pretty much it for Chicago contending as a team. And a lot of people like to play the what-if game with this Bulls team in Miami, saying if Derrick Rose hadn't hurt his knee and would have been able to stay healthy, could the Bulls have eventually beat Miami? And when you go back and watch this series, I think the answer is probably no. This is kind of incorrectly remembered as a really competitive series, and I don't think it is. Once Miami finds their footing in Game 2 with how to deal with Chicago up front, there was never a doubt that Miami was going to win this series. A couple of the games end up being close. Miami, though, ends up making all the plays when it matters. I feel like if you play this series ten times, this is a trope I like to use a lot, I know, but if you play this series ten times... I think Miami wins it 8 or 9 times out of 10, if not 10. Chicago lacked a lot of real top talent and guys who would show up when it mattered, like we see with Wade and LeBron in the big moments, especially in games 2, 4, and 5. Overall, when we look back at this Miami Heat run to the finals, I think this feels like it is Dwayne Wade's team still. The focus is definitely on how LeBron James plays from the media and the fans. And he has a really good run. There's a few rough spots, but he has a lot of big moments. He ends up being really clutch and comes through for Miami in very big moments. Has big games when he needs to have the big games. And probably is the better player throughout the entire run. Wade, as I said, is the best player in the Celtics series, but I think LeBron ends up being the best player to this point for Miami going into the finals. The issue, though, when you go back and watch them, and it's even more apparent now, knowing what eventually they will develop into and how well they'll play together moving forward, that Miami, even though they're going to make the NBA Finals, they don't really have much of an identity. They play really well on defense. They have a lot of talent, but there's not a pecking order. It is still very much your turn, my turn offense when it comes to LeBron and Wade. Chris Bosh is hit or miss and doesn't seem to know his position yet and what he's supposed to do on this team. And the bench and role players are completely makeshift, and haphazard. You can see the logic a little bit with how they put it together, and it's defensible, but this doesn't look like with the type of bench and role players you see on championship teams. So at this point, Miami actually makes the finals first, a day ahead of Dallas. So they'll end up waiting to see who wins between Oklahoma City and Dallas in the next night. But at this point, we all knew Dallas was going to be Oklahoma City, and we were getting a rematch from the 2006 finals with Miami versus Dallas. Now, in the next episode, I will get to the series finally. We'll go through each game and the permutations and all the drama behind it and eventually get to the point where I answer the questions I asked at the beginning of the very first episode on the series. But having gone through both teams' runs to the finals, I'm doubting a lot of the assumptions I had. Now it's just time to watch the actual games and see what really happened in the 2011 finals. 
So that'll do it for the second episode in this series. I have a Patreon that you can go to and support me at patreon.com slash NBA Legacy Pod. And you can also follow me on Twitter at NBA Legacy Pod as well. And till next time.